Welcome to our Deeper Mondays Bible study on this Monday in March and this Passion Week leading up to the Sunday of the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm Matthew Williams. I'm the pastor at Erlington First Baptist Church and it is my joy to welcome you to this day of Bible study and our time together in the Word of God and just lifting up our praises and our requests to the Lord in prayer. So I hope that you will take just a few moments today in your time just to spend in the Word of God and praying to Him and just lifting Him up for the awesome and mighty God that He is. It is truly a week of celebration as followers of Jesus Christ as this is the Passion Week. Again, that week where the true love and the, the passion of Christ was truly shown to the world as it led up to his crucifixion on Friday, which we call Good Friday now for a good reason, because it was through his death, the sacrifice that he made upon the cross, his shed blood, that we can find forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And then, of course, on the Sunday when he rose from the grave, the celebration of his victory over death. So this week truly is a week of celebration for believers in Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful that you have taken the time to join us today in a study of his word. Now, we're going to be continuing in our study of the Ten Commandments that we've been in on, on Mondays uh, together. So if you will find a copy of God's word, open it up to Exodus, the 20th chapter. That's where you'll find uh, the Ten Commandments that God has given us. Now, we've been studying these ten, com ten Commandments over the last couple of weeks because I believe the Ten Commandments really are a foundation for us as followers of Christ. It, it truly reveals to us the nature of God, how we are to relate to God, and how we are to relate to one another. It's really a, a formula, God's plan for us in a way to live and relate to Him and relate to others. And so it's essential, I believe, for us as followers of Christ to, to understand the Ten Commandments of God and then to apply them to our life. So we've entered into a study of the Ten Commandments and I invite you to join back with me to in, in Exodus the 20th chapter as uh, we jump back in the study of the Ten Commandments here today in just a moment. But before we do, we want to spend just a moment in prayer. Uh, again, a week of celebration and we rejoice today in our prayers uh, for the gift of eternal life that has been offered to us through Jesus Christ and his death upon the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. But also today, I know there are many other needs and even other praises that you want to bring before the Lord. So I invite you to do that now as we just join together in this time of prayer. Would you just pray with me? Father, as I come to you in this moment, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have just to study your word. Uh, Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that allows your word to then be applied to our heart and our life. And Lord, I pray that as we study your word today, your truth will be revealed, that we will uh, truly uh, see your desire for our life and how we are to live for you, how we are to relate to you, how we are to worship you, Lord. And Lord, this week, as we, we think of you and we reflect upon the great sacrifice you have made for our sins, we do praise you, Lord, for your love. We praise you for your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. And Lord, may this coming Sunday as we gather together as the body of Christ, as your church, may we celebrate your victory over death, Lord. May it be seen in our life every day and especially this Sunday. Father, I pray right now as well for those who are still sick, those who are suffering from illness, recovering from surgeries, facing surgeries, Lord. Many physical needs today in the lives of individuals who are listening and watching. And Lord, we lift up those needs to you today, knowing you are the great physician. Lord, I rejoice over the one who gave their life to you as Lord and Savior uh, this, this weekend, Lord, at, after one of our services. Lord, I thank you for that individual. And I pray, Lord, that you will just lift her up now as she begins her walk with you and strengthen her every day that she lives, that she might uh, be used by you in mighty ways in the years to come. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the impact and the influence of, of godly believers upon our community, Lord, and the opportunity we had as a church yesterday just to reach into our community with the message of your love and hope, the gospel message, Lord, through our Easter egg hunt. And for all those families that attended, Lord, I pray that they will know truly who you are as Lord and Savior. And again, Lord, now as we enter into this study, Lord, be with us, speak to us through your Holy Spirit and your word. 
as we ask these things now in the power of your name and for your honor and your glory alone. Amen. All right, so we want to jump back into our study today for just a few moments in Exodus, the 20th chapter. That's where we will be as we come to that second commandment of what are considered the Ten Commandments of God. You might say the, the Big Ten, uh, the X Commandments, however you want to call them or whatever you want to call them in that way, just to identify these as, as God's plan, God's commandments for our lives to how we are to live, how we're to relate to Him, how we're to worship Him, how we're to relate to one another in this life. And so uh, we want to jump into that today in Exodus, the 20th chapter, as we look at verses 4 through six. So if you have a copy of God's word, either digital copy or hard copy, and you are where you can stand to honor the reading of the word of God, I want to encourage you to do that today as we look at this passage together. So in Exodus, the 20th chapter, beginning in verse four, reading through verse six, you shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So we come to this second commandment in this list of commandments that God is giving to his people through Moses on the tablets. As we know, if you've studied the history of God's people in this time, uh, God is giving his people instructions on, again, how to live, how to relate to one another, how to relate to him as the one true God in their life. And so this second commandment is you shall not make for yourselves an idol. You shall not make for yourselves an idol. What would be considered the most, uh, I guess, would be detrimental thing that could bring down a nation such as America? Think about that for just a moment. I mean, would it be uh, the political parties, uh, Democrats, Republicans? I know that's been, uh, you know, a part of many conversations over the past several months as to could this be the downfall of America, this particular uh, political party, or or maybe uh, it, it might be global warming. Maybe that could bring down the nations of the world or nations such uh, as great as, as America, or maybe, maybe illegal immigration. I mean, all of these things are really hot topics in the world today. And, and consideration of well, what could destroy our world, what could destroy our nations as we see them today. But I believe if you look throughout history, what you will find is there is one thing that will always lead to the downfall of a nation. There is one thing that I believe would lead to the downfall of America, and that is idolatry. You know, it's always been the cause of the downfall of a nation. If you look in Scripture, you will see that over and over again. Idolatry. And so as we look at this truth today of idolatry in this commandment where God is saying, you should not make any idols before me. There should be no other gods before me, as we saw last week, that he is the one true God. Worship no one else. But also now, make no other idols in your life. We see it is the downfall not only of nations, but it's the downfall of man. If you look with me in the book of Romans in the New Testament, in the first chapter, in verses 18 through 25, listen to what the Word of God says about this. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. 
and exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, listen to this. Listen to what the Word of God says here. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So as you hear these words from the New Testament book of Romans, it's very clear that God has revealed himself to us. And, and this word that we find in the book of Romans coming to us from God's word, it says, because God has been revealed to us, when we choose to worship something else in this world, when we choose to worship something created by man or, or we worship the creation instead of the creator, then now we are guilty of idolatry. Now we stand before the wrath of a holy God. Now we stand in judgment upon us because of our neglect, our rejection of the one true God. And because of that, God then gives our lives over to the destruction of this world. You know, what will be the downfall of our nation? What will be the downfall of our world? It will be the same as it has been throughout history. It will be rejecting the one true God. It will be the practice of idolatry. You see, at its very core, idolatry is a worship issue. We were created to worship. We were created to worship. And so the question is, who do we worship? And the answer to that question begs the second question. What do we believe about the one that we do worship? Who do we worship? And what do we believe about the one that we worship? Well, let's look at what this second command is dealing with, that subject of idolatry. What is idolatry? Well, the first thing that we see when we examine this word in the context of the word of God, idolatry is worshiping the wrong God. First and foremost, idolatry is worshiping the wrong God. You see, every man has a God or believes in a God. Blaise Pascal the French mathematician and philosopher and physicist said this, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man. You know, the problem with this God-shaped vacuum in everyone's heart is that we can fill it with any numbers of gods, can't we? We, we can fill that God-shaped vacuum in our life with any number of gods from this world today. So idolatry then is giving our worship to any god other than the God of Scripture as revealed in Jesus Christ. Now, that's important for us to understand. When we give our worship to any God other than the God of Scripture revealed in Jesus Christ, I believe America is rampant with idolatry. I would, I would take it a step further. I believe even the church today is rampant with idolatry because idolatry comes in many different forms. You know, sometimes we think, well, it's it's only this image that we set up. It's only this this statue that we put before us. If if we're worshiping some something like that, then that's idolatry, as the scripture speaks about. But idolatry comes in many different forms. You know, religious idolatry happens when a person worships a declared deity, such as in Hinduism or Islam. You know, when we worship a declared deity, when we as man have declared this individual, this person, a God, and we worship that person, then we are committing idolatry that the second commandment forbids. Secular idolatry then occurs when people search for or find meaning, success, happiness, security, peace, or wholeness in anything other than than the God of Scripture. So you have religious idolatry where you declare someone or something a deity and you worship that person or that thing. And then you have secular idolatry where we find our happiness, our meaning, uh, we, we derive our, our purpose from this worldly thing. When we, we find it in anything other than the God of Scripture, 
That is secular idolatry. So we're we're guilty of committing idolatry in that way. You know, it, it can take many different forms in the world today. In that secular idolatry, it could be addictions such as gambling or, or overeating. I mean, if we give ourselves to constantly gambling, then it has become a God to us. And we are guilty of idolatry, overeating, even pornography, uh, alcoholism, etc. You know, family can even be an object of idolatry in our life. When we put our family before everything else and we put our family before God in our life. In a 2007 study by the Barna Group, it found that seven out of 10 adults chose or choose their earthly family over their heavenly father when asked to choose the most important relationship to them in their life. Did you hear that? That seven out of 10 adults, 70% of all individuals would choose their family relationship over their relationship with God in their life as the most important. Now that's pretty scary if you think about that. You know, I wonder where you are today in that aspect, just that one aspect of your life. Where does your family rank as far as versus your relationship with God? Be very careful because we can commit secular idolatry by placing our family ahead of our relationship with God. Of the 1,004 adults over the age of 18 that were surveyed by Barna in this study, one-third of those said their entire nuclear family is more important than God. One-third of all people says said their entire nuclear family is is more important than God. Again, that's very scary when we think about this. We have placed other relationships, other things ahead of God in our life, and we're crying out and saying, God, bless our nation. God, bless our families. God, bless our churches. But we're committing idolatry. So idolatry is worshiping the wrong God, but idolatry is also worshiping the true God the wrong way. We can commit idolatry when we do not worship God in the proper way. And I believe this is, is really the main focus of this passage. You see, in the first commandment, the, the Father made clear which God that we are to worship, that he is the one true God in the first commandment. That's what we see. And then in the second commandment, he made it very clear how we are to worship him. God was commanding his people here in Exodus, the 20th chapter, in these verses four through six, he was commanding his people not to pervert their worship of God. Notice what it says here in verse five. He says, you shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness which is on heaven above or on earth beneath or in water under the earth. Now listen to what verse five says, you shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. He says, I am a jealous God. I am the one true God, and I desire your worship. I desire all of your worship, not just part of your worship. I desire all of the worship that you have. So when we worship God in the wrong way, when we do not give him our complete worship in our life, we are guilty of idolatry. When we come to, let's say, a worship service as the body of Christ gathers together and we have all these other things that are on our mind and we're not focused upon the one true God as we are there in that time dedicated for worship of him, we are committing idolatry. That's pretty strong, you know, a, a strong conviction when we think about that. You know, what else are we thinking about? What else are we uh, dealing with in our life at that time when we should be worshiping the one true God? You see, idolatry can happen when we worship not only the wrong God, but when we worship the right God in the wrong way. And idolatry is also the perversion of the one true God. Not only is it worshiping him in the wrong way, but it's also the perversion of the one true God. When we distort God, we're guilty of idolatry. During his long career as pastor of, of New York's Riverside Church, the late H.E. Fosdick spent very many hours counseling students 
from the nearby Columbia University. And one evening, a distraught young man came into Fostick's office and, and he announced, I have decided that I cannot and do not believe in God. Of course, Fostick sat there for a moment and he he was taking in this statement from this student, and he said, all right, so what I want you to do for me is I want you to describe for me this God that you do not believe in. And so the student then sketched out his idea of this God to, to Fostick, and, and when he was finished, Fostick said to him, well, uh, we're in the same boat. I don't believe in that God either. You know, when we distort our view of God or distort who God truly is, we are guilty of idolatry. When we take who God is revealed in the scripture to us as, and we change that or we twist that to fit our situation or our circumstances or our reasons, then we are committing idolatry. You know, God has revealed himself in scripture to us. We must understand that we cannot take who God has revealed himself to be and then turn that or twist that into something that fits our situation or let, makes us feel more justified in what we do. If we do that, we are committing idolatry. And so when we distort or, or pervert the true, one true God, when we dethrone God, we're also guilty of idolatry. You know, what have we talked about that we've touched on this a little bit uh, just a moment ago? What do we do when we dethrone God? Well, we dethrone God when we trust something or someone more than we trust him. When we place our faith or our trust in something or someone more than him, then we have dethroned God and we're guilty of idolatry. When we fail to obey God, when we fail to obey God in our life, we're committing idolatry. Not only that, but when we enjoy anything more than we enjoy our relationship with God. Wow, that's a tough one, isn't it? Because there are many things in this world, there's many things in this life that we enjoy. We enjoy doing, we enjoy experiencing, and we, we have to be very careful. You know, we must never worship the creation more than we worship the creator in our life. When we dishonor God, we're guilty of idolatry. When, when we denigrate God, we're guilty of idolatry. What, what does it mean to denigrate God? Well, it means to treat God with little respect or or little importance in our life. God is just an afterthought. God is just a, a sideshow, you might say, in our life. He's, he's not the most important thing. He's not the most important one in our life. You know, when we come to worship and we fail to truly engage, again, that's, that's uh, revealing our, our true thought process of who God is. We're not putting him in that rightful place. We're denigrating him and we're ultimately committing idolatry. You know, we're just as guilty of idolatry today, if, if not more, than Israel was of breaking the second command that we find in Exodus, the 20th chapter. Now, Tim Keller, the author and founding pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, said this, Sin is, isn't only doing bad things. It is more fundamentally making good things into ultimate things. Sin is building your life and meaning on anything, even a very good thing, more than building it on God. Whatever we build our life on will drive us and enslave us. Sin is primarily idolatry. I believe that's a correct way of looking at sin in our life. And those things that take our focus, our energy, our heart, our love, our confidence away from that and the one true God. We are sinning. We are committing idolatry. So that's what idolatry is. What is God's view of idolatry? Again, if you look at verse 5, you can see that fairly clearly. He says, you shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. What is his view? Well, he hates idolatry. God hates idolatry, and he will judge it. It doesn't get any clearer than that, does it? I mean, all you have to do is read again in Romans, the first chapter, in verses 18 through 32, we see 
how God allows his judgment to come upon those who do not worship him and do not put him in his rightful place in their lives. He allows them to be given over to the sins and the destruction of this world. You know, what will be the downfall of our nation? What will be the downfall of our families, of our churches? It's worshiping other things and other people rather than worshiping the one true God. It's committing idolatry. You know, I, I believe we need to stop and we need to take an inventory in our life and we need to ask ourselves these questions. You know, are we worshiping the one true God? Is Are, are we worshiping him in the right way? You know, are we worshiping in, in, in the way that we should? Or is there anything or, or anyone more important in our life than God? Is there anything that consumes us? Is there anything in our life that we choose over God. I wonder, is there anything that we allow to interfere with our relationship with God? Well, that's a tough one. You know, if we're honest, I believe there's many times in our life that we allow things in this world and in our life to interfere with our relationship with God, to get in the way of our relationship with God. No matter how well-meaning we believe it to be, Anything that interferes with our relationship with God is idolatry. So what is true worship? How do we truly worship the one true God? How do we worship God in a way that pleases him? I believe Jesus gave us great insight in the New Testament book of John in the fourth chapter, verses 19 through 26. It says, The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers, the true worshippers, will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So how do we truly worship God? How do we avoid idolatry? How do we avoid the sin of idolatry? We worship God in spirit. God is spirit. John, the fourth chapter, verse 24 says, as Jesus says, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. This, this means that we do not get caught up in external conformity, religious rituals. See, worship is a matter of, of the heart. It's not just going through the motions. It's something of our heart. It's where we have placed Jesus Christ on the throne of our life. And so we worship him in spirit, but also we worship him in truth as revealed in scripture, that Jesus Christ is the Christ. And that's the, the final truth of the worship is that we worship him as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the chosen one, the rightful King of kings and Lord of lords in our life. It's more than just checking off a box because it's easy to reprioritize our to-do list, isn't it? Some things get more of our time, more of our attention than other things when it's just part of a to-do list. Don't make Jesus your relationship with the Lord, part of your to-do list. Make him king of kings and Lord of lords in your life. There, that way, you're not going to be guilty of idolatry for he will be in the rightful place in your life. You know, if there was any athlete that was known for his focus, it would be Michael Jordan. In Jordan's book, Driven from Within, Fred Whitfield, the president and CEO of the officers in the, of the NBA Charlotte Bobcats basketball team. He tells about a, a story, a, a time when Jordan came to 
his home and they were getting ready to to go out uh, to eat that evening it said that uh, Jordan asked if he could borrow a jacket from Whitfield's closet and so uh, he let Jordan said sure you, you know go ahead and borrow a jacket uh, it's in the closet there help yourself and so when Jordan opened up this closet he saw this closet filled with Nike and Puma brands of shoes and and clothing now the Nike outfits had been given to Whitfield as a gift from Jordan because, of course, Nike was a sponsor, one of Jordan's sponsors. And, and Jordan had given Whitfield uh, many gifts of Nike uh, wear and, and shoes. And so, so he had many of those boxes in there. But the Puma outfits had been given to Whitfield because of his relationship with an ex-basketball player and, and Puma representative Ralph Sampson. Now, Whitfield tells the story about how when Jordan saw these boxes in there and these items of clothing, that, that he brought these Puma outfits out and he brought these Puma shoes out and, and he took a butcher knife from the kitchen and he began to chop them up and just rip them to shreds. And he said when he finished ripping all these things to shreds, that he took them outside, threw them in the dumpster. And when he came back in, he, he said to Whitfield, he says, look, he said, you need to understand something. Don't ever let me see you wear anything other than Nike. You can't ride the fence. You know, I believe what we need to do in our life is we need to go into our closets and we need to clean out all of those false gods. We need to clean out all of those things that we've allowed to take the place of our worship of the one true God, whether it be family, career, finances, health, recreation, whatever it is that we have allowed to come into our life and we've said, you know what? This is more important than God. This is more important than worshiping God in my life. You know, I believe a false idol that we have sometimes in our life is just laziness. I mean, we don't want to get out of the bed on Sundays to go and worship the one true God. I believe in 2020, it's caused a, an idol of fear to come into many people's lives. You know, I'm afraid of what might happen if I'm around those people. You know, it's funny how that same fear doesn't keep some of those same people from going to a restaurant or out to other locations that they really want to go to. You know, may we take all of those false idols, all of those false gods out of our closet and rip them to shreds and put Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone on the throne of our life. Don't have any other idols. Don't have any idols in your life. Worship God and God alone. Would you pray with me? Father, as I come to you today, I thank you for the straightforward truth of this commandment, that there should be nothing else in our life in front of you, that you should be first and foremost in our life. Nothing should interfere with our worship and our relationship with you. If it does, Lord, we are committing idolatry and forgive us. Give us strength through your Holy Spirit, the truth of your word, to clean out our closets, clean out our lives of all of the idols, Lord where only you remain, where our worship is true, and you are honored and glorified as the rightful king of our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you for your love. As we ask these things in the power of your name, for your honor and glory alone, amen. Amen. May God bless you this week, this Passion Week leading up to Easter Sunday. And I want to invite you to Erlington First Baptist Church. If you do not have a church family that you worship with on a regular basis, I want to invite you to come and worship with us at Erlington First Baptist Church. What better Sunday to come and step out in faith and worship Jesus Christ and Easter Sunday, this coming Sunday. Our service will start at 1030 a.m. It's going to be a great day of worship. I invite you and your family to come and be with us here in Arlington, Kentucky at Arlington First Baptist Church. God bless you and a happy and a prosperous as we see in the Lord, that joy and, and that peace that comes and life in him this week. May it be yours in Jesus Christ as we celebrate the power of Jesus Christ over death through his resurrection. 
May God bless you.